I wanted to thank you and Matt Linder for all of for inviting me to participate. And this lady is my mother, and um, she liked to make recipes my father particularly liked. And so, one of the things he really liked was a special corn pudding. And these were the directions for it. You have to slice down the middle of each row of uncooked corn. So you take the corn cobs and go down each row with a sharp knife. Then you scrape the cob with the dull edge of the knife to get all the sweet milk out. Well, needless to say, this takes a lot of time. And my mother must have said something like, <sighs> I wish somebody would invent something to make it easier. So, of course, my father decided to do it. Yes, he's a problem solver. He was a, always a problem solver. This is the gadget he did. You would put the, the uh, bowl underneath and scrape the corn. So, once you scraped it, all of that wonderful milk came down and you co collected. Of course, you had to scrape more than once, but it was a lot easier than drawing a knife through each kernel on every row. I wanted to show you this because my father, the things that he built were never particularly aesthetically gorgeous, <laughs> but they always worked. So uh, if you click the next, I think it would tell you Look what he's making this out of. Ordinary straight nails pounded through is what cuts each kernel of corn. One of the things my father really liked to do was to listen to music. Believe it or not, this was the latest audio equipment at one time in my father's life. You took the one of those big things on the top, you can see you open it up, unwind the beginning. I don't know if you're any of you are old enough to know what a cassette looks like. Well, it was like that, only bigger. Yeah. And then it would go through where that yellow arrow has and oh, around the other wheel. So um, that worked fine. But he had a problem. And that is that he sat in a chair that wasn't really very close to the equipment. So he had a problem because on that same table is a phone and his chair was to the left. He would get phone calls and he would want to turn off the recording because when he sat and listened to recordings, he usually took his hearing aids out. So it was rather loud. So he invented a mechanical remote control. The first one ever. First one and the last one probably. Next slide. To make sure that the rope that or the string he had to pull didn't uh, fall off, he took a bit of soldering. This is soldering uh, wire that you use for making soldering something to another, but it also works well as a weight. And the, then the string ran to the stereo. What I think is cool is that <clears throat> anything to increase his efficiency. When he was writing, he did all these things to make his environment as user-friendly as possible so he could write. You can see this funny looking piece of wood is attached with a nail actually. Uh, um, to the other piece of wood and you can see the the um, part of the string that's it's attached to the end of the wooden piece. And when you pull on that, it would twist around the nail and push the button where the little red arrow is. And another push, it would turn it off. Well, eventually he got better stereo system. He always would adapt things. You can see the volume control has a um, a place where it shows what it should be and he has lines going it's actually a little bit soft right now uh, so that he could turn it and find things and all the other things are labeled because those were very small 
indentations. And if it were very bright light, you wouldn't be able to see any of them. This time, it had a real remote. This is the real remote. It was hard for him to read the controls and even harder for him to just pick the exact button to make it go on and off. So, of course, he had to fix that. So he got a piece of coat hanger, that's what that yellow part is, and bent it. And if you push anywhere on that coat hanger, it turns only the remote on and off. Response efficiency. <laughs> yeah. My father had a lot of trips in the 1960s. And every time he went away on a trip, he would always write my sister and me. This one, he was in New York City, obviously, at the Biltmore Hotel. So I, I pasted the, the bottom of the, the first page on the top there. So you can see this is the letter. I'm down on business. He said down because, because New York is, is south from Boston. I'm down on business and I'm getting thoroughly sick of it. January 170, that's of course 1970, is my deadline. No responsibilities after that date. The book is going well, but I am thoroughly rewriting it as a result of the English feedback. I'm not quite sure what the English feedback meant. It will be important though for how long it takes to be recognized as such is another matter. The book was beyond freedom and dignity. My father had called it freedom and dignity in the basement here in the house that he lived in and that Ernie and I live in now. There are all kinds of drafts of freedom and dignity. He called the book freedom and dignity, but the publisher wanted to add beyond. The problem is that if you say beyond freedom and dignity, it sounds like it's kind of against freedom and dignity, where it was exactly the opposite. And that, however, made it a bestseller. So it's interesting for me to see, it will be important though for how long it takes to be recognized, it didn't take long at all. And the last part, I'm off to England on June 30th. Your anniversary? He couldn't quite remember whether that was our anniversary, which it was. I looked at the photograph of your wedding the other day. You were radiant and I was a proud papa. I hope things continue to go well. Love, daddy. So I assumed you probably wanted to see the photograph. So the next slide is the photograph. It's just as well you can't see me because I don't look like that anymore. <laughs> That was 67 years ago. So this is in, in, in honor of the beginning of the cooperation between DeNovi and Skinner, B.F. Skinner Foundation for the bfskinnerinstitute.com. And if you can manage to type all those letters correctly, this is what you will get. If you don't get this, and I didn't one time, I had to, uh, first of all, I checked my spelling, uh, but I had to reload, but it did come up. And so this is what you'll see. You can see that coming is a talk, the behavior of the listener by Dave Palmer. And we will be having a lot of more um, CEU talks and and information and articles and all kinds of things on the B.O. Skinner Institute um, because it's very important, particularly in this day and age, when the whole world seems to be looking to punishment as the way to control other countries and everybody else. It's really important to spread the word and the science that was first started by my father.